Welcome. Uh, tonight we've got a talk, uh, Implicit Neural Representation Networks, Fitting Signals, Derivatives, and Integrals. Uh, the presenters will be Julian Martel and David Lindell. So uh, this is joint between the Silicon Valley SIGGRAPH and San Francisco Bay Area ACM. Good evening and thank you for joining the Silicon Valley ACM SIGGRAPH. We are the Silicon Valley chapter of the ACM SIGGRAPH and we've been existing since 1984. A little bit about the San Francisco Bay Area ACM. Uh, we were founded in 1957 just to promote uh, knowledge of modern computing. Um, it's a $20 annual membership. You can find upcoming talks on our meetup. We have about 11,000 members on the meetup and 185 past talks on our YouTube channel with about uh, 5,000 subscribers. So we generally have uh, a general computing talk most months and a data science talk most months. Uh, we also like to support networking, hiring um, and uh, other kind of announcements. And periodically we work with other societies such as IEEE or Valley AI. So this weekend, we've got a hands-on quantum computer, quantum computing primer. Uh, the details are in the next slides. Uh, so that's a, uh, about uh, six hours of training over Saturday morning and Sunday morning this weekend. And then uh, next uh, in February, fourth Monday of the month, um, we have Weight Watcher, not for losing weight, but for analyzing your neural net weights. It's an open source diagnostic tool for analyzing deep neural nets. Um, for a little bit more details on the quantum computing primer, uh, theory to application. So the speaker is Gaurav, who's been a speaker at a number of ACM events, um, including the data science camp in the past. Um, so we also have a discount code if you want to get a screenshot for that. And then here's uh, a list of the, the schedule that's being covered um, for the quantum computing. Uh, so also you can click on chat in the Zoom. You can type in questions for the speakers and I'm the moderator. I'll uh, bring up the, read the questions to the speakers. Also, you can chat in Zoom for technical issues or if you wanna post any announcements of like uh, your company's hiring um, or other upcoming events of interest. So just to go into a little bit of detail on tonight's talk. So conventional nets are incapable of modeling signals at scale with fine detail. They fail to represent derivatives and integrals of the signals. So we're describing three recent approaches. Sinusoidal representation networks or SIREN. Um, introduce a new framework for solving integral equations with implicit neural representation networks with AutoInt. A new architecture for scaling up implicit representations called adaptive coordinate networks or ACORN with a hybrid implicit explicit um, representation. So Julian is a postdoctoral research fellow at Stanford University in the computational imaging lab. And David is a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University and incoming assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at University of Toronto. So now please help me welcome uh, Julian and David. And if we're in person, then it'd be a good time to applaud. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Greg. Uh, sorry for jumping in a little early there. Oh, no problem. Well, so I think Julian's gonna pull up the slides and then we can go ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, great. So thanks again for having us and excited to share about our work on implicit neural representations and how we can use these to represent uh, signals, derivatives, and integrals. And I think it's something that we often take for granted uh, is actually how we represent signals. And so this is really an emerging way to capture, represent signals as the output of simple neural networks. Um, and oftentimes we, uh, well, the way that we represent signals really has a tremendous impact on how we solve problems. So for example, we might represent signals uh, or images as pixel values in an array. We might represent 3D shapes uh, with a mesh or a point cloud. And we might represent an audio signal with discrete samples in, uh, in a vector. Um, and recently, these neural implicit representations, also called coordinate-based networks, also called neural fields, uh, this is really an emerging way to represent to represent 3D shapes. Uh, and in particular, we can encode 3D shapes as the zero level set of a sine distance function. So specifically, we would parameterize the signal continuously using this ReLU neural network, takes as input some XYZ coordinate, 
and then it would output the distance uh, from that point to the surface of the shape that we're that we're interested in. And this is just a convenient way to parameterize 3D shapes using a neural network. And using this representation has many different benefits. Uh, for one, it would be agnostic. It's agnostic to the grid resolution of our, of our signal. And the memory gener generally scales with the complexity of the signal independent of the spatial resolution. And we can also use these networks to try to learn uh, priors over the space of signals that we're interested in representing, potentially for solving optimization problems as well. And while ReLU neural networks or networks with a ReLU nonlinearity are useful for representing simple objects, they generally fail when you try to encode large complex scenes with these types of networks. So in this scene, you see a lot of artifacts uh, uh, in the room, things look kind of bumpy, you're missing a lot of details uh, and so on. So this is a clear failure case of these networks. And more generally, we can ask whether in, in these architectures can represent other complex signals, such as images or even sound waves. And interestingly, we show that common network architectures using either ReLU nonlinearities or hyperbolic tangent nonlinearities will fail at capturing these high frequency details that are very common in natural signals. Um, another motivation for modeling signals with uh, a continuous representation is to solve physics-based problems. So here, these implicit neural representations could enable solving physics-based problems potentially faster, as well as finding better solutions to these problems uh, by learning priors over the space of functions that they represent. And so uh, in particular for physics-based applications, it's really critical that these architectures be able to model not only just the, the signal, um, but also uh, derivative quantities of first or higher order derivatives so that we can solve differential equations where uh, we, we have to work with these derivative quantities. Uh, and another uh, drawback of previous representations is that they can't model derivatives. And so our insight here is uh, to introduce what we call sinusoidal representation networks or SIREN. And this is a simple multi-layer perceptron network architecture where we replace the ReLU with the periodic sine function as the, as the nonlinearity. Uh, and this turns out to work really well. And we have a few ideas or some intuition as to why exactly this works or, or how this is helpful. And the first uh, intuition is that conventional nonlinearities like ReLU are monotonically increasing and the, the um, nonlinear portion of this activation function is localized uh, to a single point. And so the, you don't have this nonlinearity that's replicated across the entire input domain. And if you look at the sine activation function, you actually have this nonlinear um, function that's being replicated across the entire input domain. And this is really useful for coordinate-based networks as uh, it seems to allow them to represent complex details in different parts of the input domain equally well. Uh, another advantage is that Derivatives of a sine function are just other shifted sine functions. Uh, if you compare that to derivative of a ReLU, well, um, you get uh, a thresholding function or the second derivative is actually zero almost everywhere. So you, you can't really expect the uh, ReLU nonlinearity to model derivatives of signals very well, or at least directly. Um, so this is another advantage of the sine activation. And so we'll go through some results and also show that uh, these sirens are not only able to rapidly converge to an accurate fit for complicated functions with high frequency details, but that we can also represent and fit functions uh, not just through direct supervision, but via their derivative information. And we can actually use these to solve uh, physics-based equations and differential equations in particular. And um, so yeah, coordinate networks are an emerging field and they've been mostly, uh, well, it's really a rapidly growing field, but uh, they have been mostly used in the context of 3D reconstruction and novel view synthesis. Um, and there's also a parallel line of work that uses these um, coordinate-based networks for actually solving uh, differential equations. Um, 
Meanwhile, the sign activation in particular has been explored in different architectures for a variety of tasks, but uh, until our work hadn't really been demonstrated to robustly uh, uh, solve these equations. And we make a few contributions in our work that I won't get into too many details during this talk, but in the paper, uh, we one of the main contributions is an initialization scheme for the weights of the neural network that turns out to um, really make this architecture work well. Um, good. And so, so we're going to now walk um, uh, everybody through some examples uh, of this uh, sinusoidal uh, representation uh, networks. And we're going to show that uh, these sirens um, perform very well in range of, of application um, in fitting natural signals, as we said, like images, audio, videos. Uh, we'll also look at some um, use of these neural field, fields to solve uh, problems rooted in physics. So I will currently use uh, neural fields and coordinate-based network in, in this talk as they are uh, uh, synonyms. Um, and we look um, um, at uh, some um, example uh, uh, in physics, such as uh, so solving the Helmholtz equation, uh, the Poisson equation, and um, the wave equation. So. Um, Let's start with uh, natural signals. So here, uh, the setup oh, is the follow. Interrupt briefly. Um, there was an audience question from HW. It said mm -hmm. sinusoidal nets had been tried in the 80s but failed to take off. I vaguely recall that one of the reasons was highly rippled performance uh, function landscape. So is that uh, relating to what you were commenting earlier? You did have a paper cited from 88. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I think as well, here we need to uh, clarify that Mostly what people were using, uh, as far as I know, the neural networks in the 80s were for classification problems and regression problems, uh, the classification problems. And here we're looking at a very specific type of regression problem where the input uh, domain is a typically low dimensional field. Like uh, for these images, we're looking at uh, X belonging to R2 and trying to fit an output which is also in a very low dimensional field. So for instance, the RGB colors of, of an image. And I think what was tried in, in the 80s are more like in, in, the, um, in this classification type of scenarios. And I think sirens are not necessarily the best architectures for that. Does that answer the question? OK. So, which also introduced like this uh, fitting scenario that we are looking at, where, as I said, we're looking for um, low dimensional uh, spatial coordinates input, fitting a neural networks, neural network fitted on um, the color of these uh, pixels. And so we're looking for the function phi. So this is a neural network that is parameterized by the siren that minimizes this discrepancy between these RGB values or the grayscale values of the image and the network uh, output uh, for each pixel. So in this first experiment, we make a comparison against a different baseline architecture that use different nonlinearities, such as the rectified linear units, the hyperbolic tangents, or uh, also recently, actually I should say concurrently proposed uh, positional encoded that were presented by uh, Milton Hall et al in 2019 as well as radial basis functions, uh, which were actually uh, functions, one of the few network architectures leveraged in the 80s for function interpolation. And here we see that not only does Siren achieve this uh, 10 dB higher PSNR than all the baseline approaches that we've uh, compared to, it also converges significantly faster, which, which kind of came as a surprise to us. Uh, and this is really shown on this convergence plot on the right. Um, but it's also the only architecture that can faithfully reproduce the first and second spatial derivative of the image. And here, to be very clear, we are not taking the derivative in discrete space by taking, say, the uh, east pixel minus the west pixel to get the horizontal uh, gradient and the south pixel minus the north pixel to get the vertical gradient. We are literally talking about what happens when we take the gradient of the output of the neural network with respect to the input. That's the gradient we're computing. And same for the Laplacian. So we are via autodiff calculating derivative of output with respect to input. And this function now being parameterized by neural network is continuous because of siren is, um, is continuous. And we are plotting via autodiff what this looks like. And this is this gradient in Laplacian. And very clearly here, uh, siren is the only one to actually give you something that is 
the desirable uh, uh, gradient. So you can carry a similar experiment uh, to fit an audio waveform. So now your input field is uh, the time t, and you supervise the output of your neural network by functions f of t, which will be your audio samples at different instants. And you're looking still for this function phi that minimizes the discrepancy between uh, waveform amplitude and the um, neural network uh, evaluated at this instant uh, t. And uh, in this uh, scenario, we first tested uh, siren on the voice signal. And we, we realized it's actually the only architecture able to fit the waveform at all. So let's listen to the ground. Zero, code. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And now let's listen to the ReLU. Now, if you equip your ReLU with positional encoding, you get the following. Four, five. And this is what a siren sounds like. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I think this example is interesting because it really shows uh, this uh, intuition that uh, David was uh, telling earlier that siren might actually be the uh, only um, uh, nonlinear non activation function which actually uh, is able to fit these um, um, uh, signals with uh, stationary statistics that are shared around the input domain. And actually, it has been shown recently that uh, you can only do that if you have periodic uh, activation functions. And uh, so Siren, in that sense, is one of those with obviously the advantage of being um, n times differentiable and uh, with the uh, uh, derivatives being uh, continuous. This and is a so, question from me, uh, Greg, the moderator. Mm -hmm. Normally, I would see uh, running audio through a spectrograph and then feeding that into a neural net as opposed to the time domain. You seem like you're, I mean, you're feeding it in the frequency domain instead of time domain. Um, you seem to be representing it in the time domain. So, okay, so I, I'm not very familiar with the literature in um, regressing audio input. Uh, with neural networks. I don't even really know if this was much attempted before this uh, work, but I, I I can say for sure that if you do try to fit the signal in the Fourier domain, you would probably need a neural network with very different characteristics that, um, than, um, than, uh, than a siren. So I'm not completely sure. And actually, we have some work that also shows that it's not easy to fit signals in the Fourier domain with a siren. And you need to actually have slightly different um, architectures to, to do that. So uh, that, that's, that's a really good question. Here we are just trying, you know, can we fit a high frequency signal uh, that's in 1D? And we, we, we tried our audio. And by no means, I'm trying to say that, you know, this is you're, yeah, even you're an doing more fitting. It's not like you're doing some subset of speech recognition or audio analysis. I think yeah. that's Yeah, so here really, again, it's, it's a regression problem. So I'm, I'm sure you could, you know, probably use that for, I could imagine how you would use that for speech synthesis maybe. Uh, but it's, I would say it's a very much toy example, uh, as I say, to see, okay, can we fit a 1D signal with high frequencies? Thank you. So indeed you can, and we saw for a voice, but now you will just see it for music. Where Relu totally fails to capture the soundtrack. And now continuing a little excursion to see what kind of signals we can fit. So, well, we tried images, we tried uh, audio, which is uh, um, uh, a quick uh, question from the audience, Edward. I noticed that when using Siren to represent the voice, the replay had some background noise on playback that wasn't in the original. Uh, maybe 
he wasn't referring to siren, but maybe that middle example. Uh, where did the background noise come from? Uh, was that just, it wasn't fitting the curve very well? I think that's a really good question, actually, because I think it's a, it's, it's a very deep question. And I think David could probably say much more and we'd, we would be very happy to discuss that in the, in the, in the questions also at the end, because this I think we'll talk in line. My guess is that um, when we try, when we fit this um, audio samples, we interpolate perfectly the samples that um, uh, are given to the network, but there is some sort of uh, overfitting with uh, SARN if you don't regularize it. And I remember for this experiment, we did not, nothing really special. And so this, it would translate, you know, in very high frequencies in between the samples. And I think this would typically give you white noise, like white noise type of uh, output when you, when you listen to the fitted uh, thing. And I could imagine if we had just put a bit of regularization uh, on the, um, on the um, uh, siren, we would have actually, you know, maybe have a slightly low passed uh, version of the audio waveform, but we would certainly not have the background uh, noise. And I do imagine that um, we fit it with a slightly different rate. We have this omega zero in the paper, the, the back piece, and that's why we hear it less as well in the back piece. But uh, yeah, these are just uh, hypotheses. So here we demonstrate that Siren not only can fit audio signals, images, but can also parameterize video signals. And here, very similar. Now the input field is this uh, spatial temporal uh, cube uh, with um, uh, three uh, dimensions. Then we have uh, as a supervision output, a particular RGB value at a pixel and a given time instant. And same, we are still in the setting of this uh, regression, trying to minimize the discrepancy between the output of the neural network at this uh, space-time um, um, positions minus the um, uh, pixel uh, color uh, in this particular frame in that case. And uh, here, Saren can be shown to fit details significantly more accurately than a conventional MNP with railways. And he here, I mean, we should really note that the visual is complex. It has different uh, scenes with very little self-similarity, uh, and it still works remarkably well. It, uh, obviously, if you have a bit more uh, self-similarity across uh, time, like here, um, uh, Saren cat fits the spatial temporal signal much more uh, accurately. Some more audience questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so Michael had asked back about the audio. There appears to be different characteristic high-frequency background noise in the audio example. Mm -hmm. He asked, have you looked at spectrograms and looked at the difference? Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that uh, this could be done much more. Uh, we could make a much deeper analysis of, of, of all of that. And, and we did not, so I, I would say all this work is from 2019, actually end of 2019, but 2020. The field was restarting, really and here we had really made this choice to kind of, uh, you know, look screen a panel of applications and try to uh, uh, see, okay, where it, where it, um, you know, where, where, where does it fail basically? And we, 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 we managed to do basically everything we we wanted, and so since 2020, I think that tons and tons and tons of literature uh following uh saren but also the work of uh, uh ben uh, everything in the novel view synthesis literature that actually uh looked into many different applications in much deeper level especially in audio and uh or in videos and novel view synthesis and uh i, I would really look in this literature you know for any type of uh of a uh, deeper study of, of a particular you know, application. This was a kind of, a, you could say like a, um, a bit seminal in this trying to you know, fit all these signals and trying as David will tell us now to also use this neural representation as data structures that you can uh, embed in uh, partial differential uh, equation solvers, for instance. Okay. Um, and then uh, another question from Dave. Uh, when you want the gradient and the integral of the neural net output to match the gradient and integral of the signal, 
would it make sense to include the gradient and, ignor and integral in the loss function when training the neural net? This is an excellent idea, and this is exactly what AutoInt is doing. So we'll talk about that in great detail in a few slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think actually we get to that point a little bit. Yeah, right now, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, we showed you an example of directly supervising the network with the signal that we want to um, that we want the network to regress at the output. But we can also supervise the network kind of indirectly based on the derivatives. So this is an example of solving the Poisson equation where Again, the input to the network will be a 2D coordinate specifying a pixel location. And then the output of the network will be um, just a, a, a gray level pixel value. But to supervise the network here, we, we supervise on actually the uh, gradients of the image. So, uh, and, and we supervise the gradient of the network to match the gradient of the image. So for a forward pass, we actually, we perform a forward pass through the network predict the output, and then we calculate the derivative of the output of the network with respect to the input coordinate that will give us the gradient. Uh, and then we calculate in our loss function the difference between that gradient value and the image gradient. And then we back propagate through that whole computational graph to update the network weights. And when we do this, we find that we can actually uh, indeed solve the Poisson equation. So You'll see some examples of this. Again, this is supervising not on the image directly, but on, on the gradients shown in the green box. And when we run this with Siren, um, just by supervising on the gradients and then evaluating the normal output of the network actually gives you back the image. So the network is actually solving the Poisson equation uh, by, by this method of supervision. And actually, it's the only network architecture that we tested uh, that was able to do so. Um, and you can also, so it accurately gives you both the image uh, as well as the second order gradient information. And again, we see similar trends to before where the convergence is quite fast. And in terms of quality, we're, uh, you know, over 10 dB uh, higher in terms of PSNR than the other methods. So this is really interesting that we can supervise not only on the signal itself, but also on derivatives. Uh, and in fact, that's really useful for solving other types of uh, equations that have derivatives in them. So one example of this is the iconal equation, which is actually um, used to describe these sine distance functions for representing 3D shapes that I talked about earlier. So specifically in this case, the input to the network is now a three-dimensional coordinate and the output will be the sine distance, which is essentially just the distance from that point in space to the nearest surface. And you can use this to represent 3D shapes. Uh, and so to train the network, we supervise it on this loss function. Um, and essentially what, this, what these different terms mean, uh, well, the first term means that for points that are on the surface, the distance should be zero. Uh, in the second term, we also uh, assume that we know for these on-surface points um, what the surface normal is. And so we supervise the gradient of the network at the surface to point in that direction. Uh, and the third term satisfies the constraint of the iconal equation where the gradient everywhere is equal to one. Um, in the end, basically this iconal equation is describing this sine distance field where uh, it has this characteristic that every point in space basically gives you a distance to the nearest surface. Um, and so this is just a differential equation that we can use and uh, to parameterize 3D geometry. And so we can fit the network to represent 3D geometry. And in this particular instance, this very detailed um, Thai statue. And if we compare, if we fit the network to this shape and then we extract the output as a mesh and visualize it, what you see on the left is uh, fitting this shape with a ReLU architecture and on the right is with Siren. And it's pretty clear that we can capture significantly higher details with uh, Siren significantly higher frequency details with the Siren architecture. And that trend uh, also holds true for even larger scale scenes. So this is actually fitting an entire room size scene with Siren compared to the ReLU architecture. And um, again, we can capture these high frequency details and the overall fidelity of the scene is much better. So for example, the curtains or the, uh, the feet of the sofas are actually captured with Siren, whereas the other architecture um, fails to regress these fine details. 
when supervised. Does getting this better detail help with um, object segmentation, like you know, identify the difference between the couch and the carpet and tables and chairs as different objects? Or yeah. that, a separate problem that you're not really spending effort on? So at the time of this paper, we were really just trying to find uh, an architecture where you could even fit like a single scene. But now we're seeing these types of coordinate based networks really exploding for all sorts of applications. I've seen demos for semantic segmentation. People are uh, and people have started to write papers on this uh, also for like shape completion or. Um, or um, like single image. You take an image and you estimate this, the corresponding 3D shape uh, of an object in that image. Uh, these network architectures are really flexible and actually tend can be used for a lot of different higher level tasks. So I think this work, uh, well, in retrospect, I think perhaps is, uh, it kind of kicked off a lot of these applications in using um, uh, coordinate based networks. Um, because before, again, we couldn't really even fit these signals with these with uh, this type of fully connected network architecture. Um, so I'll give you another example of solving a differential equation using Siren. And in this case, we're going to solve the Helmholtz equation. So again, the input to the network is just a 2D coordinate, and the output would be the complex value of the field at that point. And here, to supervise the network, uh, we're not supervising the network to fit the solution of the Helmholtz equation directly, but we basically supervise the network to minimize the residual of the PDE. So uh, the, the, these terms that you see here inside the integral on the right um, basically involve taking derivatives of the neural network output and checking that the uh, output satisfy the partial differential equation. Uh, yeah, so this is called the residual. And if we minimize this, basically the network learns to represent the solution of the differential equation. Uh, and this works fairly well. Of course, there are some other things we have to consider. Um, uh, boundary conditions of the Helmholtz equation, in this case, using perfectly matched layers. This just ensures that there's a unique solution to the equation. But we can implement all this in the loss function. And as long as we do this correctly, uh, actually, we get uh, fairly robust performance. And Siren converges to the, the uh, ground truth solution significantly better than, well, these other network architectures um, just can't model these derivatives and uh, fail to converge to a solution. And uh, one other application I want to show is the wave equation. So now we're just adding the time dimension here. And so we have a 2D spatial coordinate uh, as well as the time dimension. And again, we're supervising the network by minimizing the residual of, of this partial differential equation. And uh, again, we see the same trend. So basically, you can solve the wave equation using Siren. And if we compare it to a conventional architecture like hyperbolic tangent, um, basically, we see that uh, we can actually converge to the solution with Siren, whereas it's not something that a conventional architecture can, can be used to do. OK, and so far we've been we've shown fitting a siren to a single scene or a single image or a single 3D shape. But uh, we also have some results. And there are more details in the paper just to show that you can actually use a single siren to generalize over, for example, many different images. And so here we're actually using a separate net network to predict the weights of a siren. Uh, that would represent a different image. So specifically, an input image gets encoded by this hyper network. It predicts the weights of a siren to then render uh, that image. And what's convenient about this type of architecture is that you can use it for solving inverse problems. So you can condition this encoder based on a few input samples of the image. And then you can actually predict the weights of a siren that completes the image or does image in painting. Um, so this architecture is just showing that this architecture can not only represent signals, but also generalize across the space of signals and is useful for um, even certain types of uh, inverse problems as well. So 
all in all, and I think it's perfectly illustrated with what uh, David showed, like we can really think this siren as uh, representing, you know, parameterizing uh, complex functions uh, via their weights. And as David showed in the previous application, you could even have another neural network, we called it a hyper network, that would predict the weight of this function and then would generate all the functions, if you wish, that can represent faces. So it's a very convenient new type in some sense of data representation of data uh, structure. And uh, you can uh, fit uh, images, videos, sound as we saw, you can embed it in PD solver. And it has all these nice um, properties, right? It's a continuous parametric function, as I just said, but it has this very funny now um, way to scale with the signal complexity rather than with the resolution. So if you want to represent a grid, an image, and you want a one megapixel image, well, you need to store somewhere on your computer the 1,000 by 1,000 array that represents your image. But in this neural network, it kind of embeds this compression directly, and that's what we mean by memory scale of signal complexity independent of the resolution, because in some sense, it's not completely clear how you know how much information you're going to be able to embed in all those weights. But really, if you have a one megapixel by one megapixel images, it might perfectly be that you can represent it by, you know, three layer uh, siren, each layer having 256 by 256 uh, uh, weights, for instance, right? So, um, and finally, you can uh, fit signals by the first and higher order derivative. So it's kind of interesting because it's, it's very compatible with many, um, applications where you would need interpolation to, for instance, address or query points which you do not have on your grid. So if you want in an image to query the point, I don't know, 237.2 and 257.8, you need to tell me which interpolator you want and then take the points around and interpolate. And in this, in this neural network, you're literally just going to uh, input um, uh, two face 37.2 and the other number I said, and then get the output. And as an interpolator, you get the behavior of the neural network when it regressed the function. So um, wh what are the challenges really towards this, uh, um, uh, towards using those data structures for everything? C could we even use them for everything? And can we in particular use them for very large scale uh, applications, say? millions of points, uh, point clouds or gigapixel images. And so this is what we explored with uh, uh, um, uh, David in this uh, uh, other uh, application. And so one challenge, if you think uh, to fit this large scale neural representation is that if you had say a volume of uh, 1K times 1K times 1K voxels, so that's what 1 billion voxels, you would need 1 billion forward passes for a neural network because you need 1 billion queries to even address all the points and to uh, output your volume. So no need to say that if this is what you need to query your whole volume at test time, you will need 1,000 times that at inference time to actually fit it on this volume. And so um, what you would really want uh, is, um, a neural network first that has the capacity to do that. So the challenge is, okay, what type of neural networks have the capacity to do that? What's the architecture to do that? How can you try to reduce the training time uh, that uh, instead of taking, uh, you know, hours of days already would take, uh, you know, more of the order of minutes or seconds. And test time is also prohibitive because you have billions and billions of uh, passes through this neural network just to query or output uh, the volume. So here we are about to present an architecture that address all these challenges. But first, uh, let me tell you in more details issues with various uh, architecture that one has envisioned or could envision to represent large scale signal. So Obviously, if you're looking at uh, conventional voxel grids, we, we refer to those as explicit architectures because they explicitly encode the grid um, or you know, neural networks that would do that. They might come in different flavors, but the commonality is they would take, for instance, false voxel grids or features defined on those as inputs and um, output the signal of interest at each voxel. And so this has been seen in, in methods such as deep voxels or neural volumes. 
And those are typically computationally efficient because you address the representation as a single as a simple lookup for a table, but it's very memory inefficient for large scale because you need to explicitly store the grids. So, so then you have SARAN, right? These uh, neural fields or coordinate-based networks, uh, uh, implicit representations that have also been called. And they do not operate directly on the grid or the features organized on the grid, but they take input uh, coordinates and they regress the signal as an output. Uh, so SARAN, Fourier feature network uh, with ReLU and positional encoding are of this type. And those representations, they typically embed some compression by representing the signal as if they were decomposed on some basis functions. They are memory efficient because um, as I said, like now you do not need to explicitly store the grid, but you store the weights of these neural networks so they can be efficient and the neural network can be small, but querying them requires one forward pass for every single point that you want to output, which is what we're trying to combat. Just as a comment from Greg, is this almost like doing a, a vector graphics versus pixel graphics, where it's a simple uh, representation with lines, just as an analogy? That's very interesting. I really like this. I, I never had anybody put it in that terms, but I really like this analogy because in some sense, in vector graphics, more than even replacing a, a line, you choose some basis function. So it could be a line in the case of vector graphics. And then you describe your drawing with this uh, primitive in some sense. And I think this is very similar to what indeed these neural fields do. You choose a basis function, you choose a primitive, and you represent your whole um, volume in the case of 3D with this primitive. So I think it's a very nice analogy, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's three audience questions. Would you like to take them now or, or later? Well, or... The, I'll try to, uh, if they are not too long, I'll, I'll happily answer now. OK, um, uh, whatever your judgment is. Uh, Edward was commenting, Siren seems so much better than Relu. What's the catch? Does Siren require more time? Well, time so better? this is super interesting. Uh, excellent question. The catch is Relu because they are so simple, if you wish, and uh, do not overfit as easily. So in, if if you if you really want, you know, like to do some classification architecture just by Occam's razor principle, you in some sense want something which you know, gives you the simplest explanation to yes, separate your points, right? That, that's not really what sirens are great for. In some sense, they have so much uh, expressiveness or, or capacity because of these many um, non-linearities are replicated through the input fields, which really has to do with uh, a kind of a stationarity of the, of the kernel. If you take this Gaussian process view of your neural networks. And there's been a lot of theoretical work in that direction, trying to study these networks, these neural fields as um, 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 uh, infinite uh, Gaussian processes. Um, so, so yeah, okay. Um, and then this is more of a comment than a question. This is from HW, um, quote, as Greg said, for neural net based audio processing, typically mel substrum coefficients are fed mm -hmm. in as input to relu based net. In my opinion, it's unfair to ask a highly nonlinear net, such as ReLU, to approximate relatively smooth uh, band-limited sinusoids contained in audio signal directly. Similar comment for the Helmholtz equation, which is relatively smooth phenomena of waves, diffusion, and, and strings, et cetera. Um, any well, response comments? Well, no, I mean, this is exactly that, right? So um, uh, I think uh, this is exactly the point. Uh, people are using ReLU, and indeed, you should not use ReLU. Then, then it's kind of like choosing the right basis function. Exactly. Right it's job. exactly choosing like the right basis function. And uh, and if you're trying to represent uh, smooth uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, like the um, a, a car, right? People invented Bezier curves for that and, uh, and uh, NURBS and things like that. And well, now, if you want to represent uh, kind of uh, complex functions and regress those, maybe you should better use sirens or positional encoding than uh, using a ReLU. So then saying it's unfair is kind of uh, judgmental. So I would say, I, I agree that's exactly what- Well, maybe respond, it's for. strategic. It's a strategic it's, yeah, decision. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so you were just pointing out, you're, you were demonstrating that just to point out the advantages where it is a sweet spot. So it was an intentional. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, David was making a comment. He said, uh, Edward, indeed, different types of architectures seem to have their pros and cons. A major benefit of Siren is that it can overfit signals really well under direct supervision, but it tends not to interpolate between these unsupervised points in a smooth fashion. Relo doesn't fit high frequency details as well, but can be useful to provide smoother interpolation for sparsely supervised signals. 
exactly. That's an excellent. Uh, that's an excellent summary. And I would slightly modulate the uh, siren. Uh, so siren very much tend to overfit, but you can very highly regularize sirens. And this is how you end up having, you know, these 3D shapes, for instance, that don't show, you know, crazy amount of, uh, you know, surface noise, for instance. So, um, yeah. Okay, so and it smooths out the point cloud to have adjacent oh, points to make well, a smoother, uh, smoother surface of a table so, or something. So, so that would be an option. You can you can filter the input if you wish, but you can also, uh, you could use total uh, variation, for instance, on the output of your neural network, because we have access to the derivative of the, output with respect to the input of the neural network. And so if you have that, then you can train the, the network subject to you know, cost functions that would imply something on the derivative of the neural network, such as smoothness, right? Sure, okay. So that's exactly what we've done. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's all the comments or questions, but thank you. Yeah, no, these are super good uh, comments, so yeah. Okay. Oh, and a quick question Dave was asking, mm -hmm. uh, maybe read that math symbols in the chat window. What is the angle bracket delta V? Um, uh, he was asking about a specific, a specific equation, if you can open the chat briefly. Oh, I see. So, yeah, okay. So, uh, nabla phi, nabla f, nabla is the vector of uh, all the component derivative component wise, and the brackets, uh, we, we use that for the for the uh, dot product. And in fact, what this thing is doing, if you think about it, is it's computing something like a cosine uh, metric between the neural network and the normals. And as David said, that's what allows you to align, to have in your cost function, to express in your cost function that the normals um, of, uh, of uh, sirens, if you wish, needs to be aligned with the normals of uh, your, uh, on the surface of your uh, point cloud. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we were talking here about local implicit representation and, uh, oh, so I, I didn't describe yet what they are. So local implicit representations are yet another type of architectures. And this is a, there was a stream of work. Uh, I mean, there's still a stream of work on now you try to divide your volume in some um, subregions. And in each subregion, you're gonna fit a global, uh, um, implicit representation or neural field. So in some sense, instead of fitting one neural field to the whole volume, you divide it in subregion and fit it in, uh, and fit one neural field per subregion. And this is, uh, for instance, uh, the tons of super great work actually in this space, like local implicit uh, image functions, deep local shapes, conversion occupancy nets as well, um, neural geometric level of details and neural sparse voxel fields that go in that direction. And uh, those are usually more memory efficient than explicit representation because you can have fewer subregions typically than uh, uh, if, you, if you consider one subregion would be a, a pixel in the extreme case. And it can be more computationally efficient than implicit representation because you still only evaluate the signal uh, locally. So uh, one problem of these representations among others is that you know, they don't really have a notion of scale and I think it's very desirable to have uh, to represent signals at different scale and depending on the architecture you use and there are various of architectures here we would just give five works uh, on this topic might or might not allow pruning and so typically what we mean by this is you might be in cases where you do fit um, neural representation even in places where there's actually no information or because for instance you have a constant color on the image or there's empty space for instance in a, in a volume um, and so we designed uh, um, in, in a follow-up work uh, of, um, of Sarah and we designed this uh, ACORN which we call hybrid implicit explicit architecture and it's a computationally and memory efficient uh, architecture that represents part of the signals that uh, at different scales that depend on the amount of details, uh, if you wish, that region contains, that also embeds pruning uh, to, to use resources in the neural network only in regions of the signal that actually need it. And it consists of two parts, something we call a global coordinate encoder that encodes block coordinates. So that encodes, if you wish, subregion um, as features in a grid that can be then decoded with the second part of the architecture, which is a continuous local coordinate um, 
um, with a continuous local coordinate in this subregion that then goes to a, a, a neural field. And we named this architecture a code for adaptive coordinate networks. And this is what it looks like uh, schematically, but we're gonna go over that uh, quickly. And we'll show that not only a con architecture can fit signals better than simpler architectures like SARIN or local implicit representation, but it's also much, much faster as uh, demonstrated in those first uh, results. So here we were fitting like a 16 megapixel images, so 4K by 4K image in um, less than a, a minute uh, with ACORN, while it would take uh, to reach the same level of PSNR uh, about an hour with a SARIN, like an hour, 20 minutes. And so here you see um, the length decomposition that has been uh, jointly learned by the, by the, by the architecture. And uh, ACORN really allows you to train representation couples of orders of magnitude faster than SARIN. Uh, so here we were looking at the same image uh, at 64 megapixel resolution. This is a NASA image um, of Pluto, and um, and yeah, and so David will tell us uh, about uh, details of the architecture now. Yeah. So one of the main uh, contributions or insights here was how to do this adaptive partitioning of space so that the network can allocate more capacity to regions of the signal that are more detailed uh, while more easily representing regions that are uh, maybe not as textured or have flat textures uh, or easier to represent. And so the idea is to carry out this optimization online while the network is training using a separate optimization step <laughs> that consists of an integer linear program solving an integer linear program and so you basically monitor the uh, loss within each of these blocks. And you have a constraint that you, you allow the network to have a certain maximum number of blocks. And if the error is too high, you can subdivide and have uh, more capacity, allocate more blocks to that particular region. So specifically, we identify each of these blocks with a global coordinate. And then inside each block, we can uh, we have a local coordinate to, uh, to actually define a particular point in space. And each of these blocks also has a particular scale that's associated with it. So you can think of this as kind of like an octree structure, but actually we only represent every point in space at a, at a single scale. So the blocks together entirely, completely partition the space. Um, and, and, and then- uh, it Looks like a variation of a KD tree. Uh, it, the KD trees be in a way to index uh, K nearest neighbors in like hundred dimensions or something like that, where you adapt the resolution. Yeah, it's a similar idea, I would say. Um, and you basically, the idea is to achieve this adaptive resolution. And the goal here is to actually do this during training, which we do by monitoring that loss function and subdividing regions that need more network capacity. That's the overall idea. And so we have this. Uh, like this block level coordinate and then local coordinates within the block that we can use to query the network. Um, and so given this global block coordinate and the local coordinate, uh, or sorry, given the global, the coordinate for a block, we, and the scale associated with that block, we feed this into a, into what we call our, our coordinate encoder, which will allow us to query any, any uh, values represented within that block. So this, this coordinate encoder actually outputs a long vector of features, which we rearrange into uh, a feature grid with multiple channels. So we take this long vector, we rearrange it into separate cubes of features or multiple channels of 3D features. And then for any coordinate within, this, um, within the block represented by these features, we can simply interpolate uh, uh, one of these feature vectors at the corresponding uh, spatial coordinate within that block and extract this feature vector. And the idea is that we can amortize the computation. So if we want to render out a region of the image within a block, we only have to do one forward pass through this large coordinate encoder. We get a feature grid that we can then uh, query out or interpolate within. And then these feature vectors are fed through a, a, a very small decoder network that is very efficient to evaluate. And so now all the computation or 
rendering out all of these points within one of these blocks that are partitioned the space is very efficient because it's just an interpolation operation and then a forward pass through this small decoder network. And so here's the, the overall, question oh. from the audience. Uh, Michael was uh, stating there's a lot of work in adaptive mesh refinement or AMR, yeah. which seems very similar. Not sure if you drew on any of this work. Yeah, uh, this, this is more of a comment. Absolutely. We were looking at uh, uh, that was definitely an inspiration for us and trying to adapt uh, these ideas to um, neural, neural scene representation and neural fields. Um, of course, the context and the problems that we're solving are a bit different, but still this idea of how do you, um, you know, in the adaptive mesh refinement, how, do, how would you subdivide a mesh? And that's often used for problems in finite element analysis uh, or finite element methods. Here, yeah, how do we partition the scene and minimize the fitting error of our neural network? But um, I, certainly similar ideas, and that was an inspiration for us. Uh, and then on your... C, is that referring to three channels, like three dimensions, X, Y, Z, or red, green, blue, as far as channels, or is that something different? Yeah, C means channels, and um, the channel, the amount of channels is basically a hyperparameter, and it, it just corresponds to the number of, of um, entries in this final feature vector that goes to our decoder network. So would you, would you be able to do have, have another channel and do X, Y, Z in time, so that way you're encoding video. Yeah, so the um, you could you could do you could do time as well. Uh, this could all be encoded in in the architecture by adding more dimensions. You would you, yeah, th th that's absolutely right. I mean that way you'd have almost built-in object tracking. I mean not that you have it uh, segmented at the object level, but it might be a, a good representation for that. Yeah, certainly. So I think. Um, yeah, you could look at it, it, it's, we have it in 3D here, but you could look at higher dimensions as well. And then, yeah, I think looking at applications like object tracking with these types of architectures is, is certainly possible. Okay, so this that's the kind of overall view of the, the architecture um, from the coordinate encoder to predicting out the feature grid and then interpolating within that using a decoder network and extracted features to predict the signal. And this turns out to be um, very efficient. We've already shown a couple results, um, but you can scale it up uh, to a much larger scale than we ever showed with Siren. So this is actually a gigapixel image, fitting a gigapixel image. And I think the largest image that we tried, largest image that we tried to fit with Siren was, was maybe a 512 by 512 pixel image. Well, here we're, this is actually a billion pixels. And it can fit the signal to and with very high fidelity. There's some ghosting artifacts. There's some people that are cut off here. That's actually in the data, just the way this panorama was captured. Um, and so, yeah, this was this was really unique in in, the, in being able to fit these types of large scale signals with a uh, a, a neural field essentially, but really taking advantage of this hybrid decomposition and uh, the adaptive decomposition and this hybrid architecture. Um, oh, and I do see a question. I can pause and take that question too uh, about Hello. issues at the boundaries of these cubes uh, where you have different resolution. Yeah, so it is possible to see some seams in the signal. Uh, in practice, I, I think the results look pretty good. Although if you really zoom in and, and stare at it hard enough, you can, you can see some seams. So um, I think there's been, or people, uh, people have been looking at some follow-on work to try and overlap the cubes or somehow mitigate these, these seams. And uh, so there are some strategies that you could take to, to try to alleviate that. But um, yeah, we didn't notice that it was a huge problem, but if you, if you squint at it hard enough, you may be able to see that. Uh, oh, and here are some additional results for 3D shape fitting. So, uh, this is a similar idea to what we showed with Siren, where you're representing the, the 3D shape using the neural network. And the advantage with ACORN is basically that we can train these faster uh, than Siren or other representations, and we achieve a higher fidelity fit to, um, to these 3D shapes as well. So you can see 
and the scales of the dragon and these fine details uh, on the legs and these grooves and, and etched regions are, are captured uh, with higher quality. Oh, and here's another challenging example uh, with this 3D model of an engine. And there are lots of wires and fine details that are really difficult to capture with um, conventional models. And I think we do a fair bit better using this, using ACORN with this adaptive decomposition strategy and the hybrid architecture. And again, a similar trend for this Thai statue that we saw before, but now with ACORN, we get a bit more detail. Now that we have seen um, these uh, neural fields in many different flavors, different architectures, a lot of work uh, in this field in the last uh, two years, um, we kind of uh, took the stance and th that those coordinate-based networks might eventually, who knows, one day, constitute an alternative to, conven to conventional grid-like representations. So maybe, you know, soon you won't be storing arrays really to represent these complex signals, but maybe you'll be representing these signals by the weights of a neural network. And the key question that you have now is, how can you operate on those new type of representations? So here we show how can we can fit them, but uh, maybe, you know, if you have a, a grid-like representation, you want to, you know, take the sum of uh, two images to do, I don't know, like alpha blending. It's not clear at all how you would do that with a neural network. You're clearly not gonna take the sum of the weights and alpha blend them and hope that uh, the sum of the weights represents the sum of the images that those weights uh, represent if you're taking your fields because of all these nonlinearities, that's, that's clearly not going to happen. So we do think that there's an interesting uh, new research direction that would study the class of algorithms that would operate on these continuous representations on these uh, neural networks, agnostic to grid resolution and our little, um, uh, contribution to this is, uh, is uh, auto-ints, where um, we are about to demonstrate how some of those operations, namely integrations, which are notoriously hard to perform on conventional representations, are actually particularly easy or feasible, I should say, with these uh, neural, neural, um, neural fields. So, Contrary to these grid-like representations where you know making a sum is uh, very easy, you just take a pixel-wise uh, elements, uh, elements say uh, element-wise, and just uh, sum sum them, and it's perfectly fine. You can't do that with neural network, uh, but with the weights of a neural network, but you can do those other operations as integration and iteration, which would be much more complicated, you know, with, with grids, uh, because you need to choose the discretization uh, and uh, and so on. So integration is really this uh, fundamental concept uh, at the core of uh, science and engineering, and it's uh, ubiquitous in uh, computer vision applications. And uh, uh, notoriously, uh, if you're looking at applications such as uh, uh, volume rendering, um, you're actually immediately looking at, uh, at uh, integration. Um, so this is this neural volume rendering uh, proposed uh, initially in uh, NERV by uh, Milden Hall et al. Uh, was um, really has set a new standard and a new paradigm for view synthesis um, and achieving really impressive photorealistic image quality. And in, in those type of applications, you would find integration, like in the volume rendering equation, uh, where you and how how does it translate in this uh, neural um, applications, well, um, you're going to train a neural network to actually learn the absorption and the emission parameters of your medium from a large corpus of uh, training views that have been taken from different camera positions, and then can be uh, re-rendered uh, from the learned volume after uh, training. So this is like this novel view synthesis application, and this is in particular the application we're looking, we're going to look at for our in the training data. Framework. In the training data, does it include some kind of tilt, pan, zoom, or rotation, or it's just, is there any parameters on the camera location? So, so very 
originally, uh, those were taken at, uh, say, uh, arbitrary, let's call it unit distance from, you know, like the center of the scene, uh, uh, or, you know, typically on the, on the grids uh, uh, for front facing applications. But I mean, after NERF was proposed in, in uh, 2020, or 20, yeah, many, many, many follow up papers have looked at tons of different um, uh, scenarios, including zooms and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, in this new rendering technique, um, we have the evaluation of integrals along rays through a learned uh, volume to render uh, the scene. But evaluating these, evaluating these integrals along these rays is computationally inefficient because it requires millions of queries to a neural network to sample each ray along in the volume uh, so as to approximate the integral and uh, finally render the color at your uh, pixel. And in this work, we propose a new method that can learn closed form solutions to integrals using our uh, neural network, uh, neural fields. And we'll show how it can be leveraged for computationally efficient uh, neural volume rendering. And we are still in this scenario of neural fields in which we have input X and output phi of X that is, uh, X would represent, for instance, uh, pixel coordinates, or in the case of volume rendering, the uh, position in the volume, and um, the pixel value uh, for an image, or for instance, the case of volume rendering would be the uh, um, absorption, for instance, of the volume at that particular position. And one thing to, to note is that um, when you're looking at uh, integration, you're looking at something very difficult, very difficult because finding closed form solutions to derivative calculation is a far easier task than solving integrals in closed form. So, I mean, we know, we know algorithms to uh, compute uh, derivatives. That, that's the chain rule. It's a simple yet powerful tool that enables uh, virtually calculating derivative on very large computational, any derivative on very large computational graph. And, you know, at the basis of training all of differentiable programming and training all these uh, neural networks through black propagation. Now, if you look at integration, uh, finding closed form solutions for integrals can be extremely challenging or even impossible. And uh, you typically, typically requires expert applications of heuristics or extremely complex algorithms, which took decades to be implemented between the moments when they were theorized and the moments uh, they were actually implemented. That's the case of this Rich algorithm and are still being refined nowadays, actually. So how do people typically tackle integration? Well, they often approximate them numerically uh, through techniques like uh, uh, Riemann sums, um, quadrature, or Monte Carlo sampling, for instance. And all these sampling-based methods, we could call them, come with a fundamental trade-off between their accuracy and the runtime uh, based on the number of samples that you use to approximate uh, this integration. So the idea with uh, this auto end method was that we would calculate uh, integrals, or we'd actually learn integrals that could be evaluated with only two evaluations of a neural network rather than the hundreds of, about, hundreds of uh, samples that are usually required with techniques like Monte Carlo integration. So to calculate integrals with uh, this auto end method, we introduced the concept of an integral network, which we're going to call phi, which is a neural field or coordinate-based network that can be realized or implemented as a multi-layer perceptron. And then we can observe that calculating the derivative of this network with respect to one of its inputs corresponds to evaluating a new computational graph. And, and so this new computational graph that's being shown here below uh, is a new neural network with the same parameters as the integral network, but with a slightly different architecture. And so we call this new representation the grad network because it's uh, what you get when you take the, the derivative of the original integral network. And the key insight is that we can actually train this grad network to represent signals. And after training, we can then use the weights that are learned to reassemble the integral network since the weights are shared between them. Uh, and 
then by construction, this integral network represents an antiderivative of the fitted signal. And so by the fundament, fundamental theorem of calculus, you can, uh, uh, this integral network is an antiderivative of the grad network. And then you can evaluate any definite integral of a signal that was represented by the grad network by simply evaluating this integral network at the two bounds of integration. So to summarize these different steps, uh, basically auto -in involves the following procedure. So first you would specify the architecture of the integral network. This could just be a, a conventional multi-layer perceptron, for example. The grad network is instantiated with the computational graph corresponding to the partial derivative of this integral network output with respect to the input coordinate that you want to integrate over. And then the grad network is trained to fit the signal you want to integrate. And after you've trained the grad network, you can reassemble the integral network uh, using the trained weights and then evaluate this to evaluate the integral. So just a bit on the implementation details. Uh, so we actually store the integral network in the nodes of a directed acyclic graph and a little framework we built that sits on top of PyTorch. And then we built our own, uh, basically our own little compiler that will, that will run um, auto diff essentially and compute explicitly and explicitly instantiate the graph corresponding to the grad network. And so, um, Right, so this is what the grad network looks like. And it has this interesting tree-like structure, uh, which is a result of just taking derivatives and the chain rule. And another way that, uh, well, another insight we had is that you can actually evaluate this more efficiently since all these weights in the, um, I guess the, the legs or the branches of this network are the same. You, you can actually share that computation between the branches uh, and, and just evaluate those, those matrix multiplies a single time. And as an example of how you could use uh, this auto in framework, consider that you wish to integrate uh, this one dimensional uh, signal. So here you're gonna fit uh, the grand network to the signal with direct supervision and um, your um, integral network, then reassemble your uh, integral network and you can evaluate your uh, integral network and you would get the integral and you can get any definite integral by just evaluating the integral network twice. Uh, so at the, bound, at the two bounds of uh, integration. And again, by Labney's formula, you would simply get the integral. And so um, let us see how Autoint can be used to evaluate integrals in two, dimension, in two dimensions and in a slightly more realistic scenario in computed tomography. So here we wish to integrate along um, a parallel rays through this uh, simulated uh, 2D phantom. And as we uh, calculate integrals along rays at varying angles, uh, you can create an image of the projections that is called a sinogram. And the integral equations that compute this projection is called the random transform. So that's the typical computer, computer tomography setup. And for this example, we're gonna suppose that we are given uh, measurements in these sinograms as a sparse collection of projections. So that we're representing here, like sparse projections, for instance, along the angle uh, theta. And our goal in this toy problem is going to be to estimate the projection at unobserved angles. And so we choose this prime setup because um, if you look at the, at, at the map a bit more closely, it's very, very similar to the actual um, NERF slash novel view synthesis uh, problem, but now in uh, you know, one dimension uh, fewer. And um, what we are actually using to solve this problem is the following uh, training loss. So we are taking our uh, grad network psi and um, looking at the, um, trying to match the output of psi of all, at all the given projections. Uh, and here we're using some Monte Carlo approximation during, uh, during training to actually sample the um, uh, uh, grand network. And so um, since the grand network contains the derivative of the, uh, uh, 
active uh, of the activation function, as we saw in these little uh, sketches of what these grad networks uh, look like, it's pretty clear that now the nonlinearity is going to play an even more crucial role, if I could say, in the in in, in how you can fit those uh, signals. Because now we are, I, uh, I, I want to, to be super clear, now we are fitting the derivative of these neural networks in which we have this derivative of nonlinear functions. And we observe really, I mean, it's empirical that smooth nonlinearity such as Swish um, have better fitting and generalization properties. Um, so typically if you, do give more projections um, to the to the network. Well, you do not see a big difference between a siren, a switch, and the soft plus used in this uh, autoint uh, framework in the grand network. But as you go towards more and more subsampled version of your uh, sinogram, so you're showing less, you're supervising with less and less projections. So said in yet another way your unknown view tomography problem is even more difficult because you're taking less and less images if you were in a real uh, you know, um, uh, tomogram uh, setting. And as you, as you go towards very, very high subsampling, in fact, very well behaved nonlinearities such as SWISH seem to perform again when you're um, supervising on your graduate work much better than SARA and soft plus in real world. So here we are really touching what we discussed uh, earlier in this talk, which is uh, if you do not regularize the sirens in, in any way, they have almost too much freedom to do whatever they want during projections, uh, in, in between projections, while Swish is much more likely to do something which will be a good linear uh, interpolation or, or something of that, of that order. So finally, we demonstrate uh, autoint for the applications we actually, well, that we were interested in, which is this uh, three-dimensional uh, neural rendering application. And we aim to render scenes by evaluating the volume rendering equation that, that is shown here. Um, and with this equation, we render each pixel by casting a ray through our volume and integrating the absorption, transmittance, and emissive radiance of the color along the ray. And um, these are the terms here. Uh, so the in the, in the volume rendering equation, the, the color of the rendered ray is the integral between the near and the far plane of the absorption coefficient that is model, modeled by the transmittance. And the transmittance is simply the exponentially decayed uh, accumulated absorption up to that point. So this is exponential of minus the integral from the near plane to the point you're considering of the absorption of the medium uh, at that point, multiplied by the eventual emissive uh, radiance of the of the um, uh, medium, and now you can see that uh, when we design this whole nice uh, integral uh, uh, framework to to calculate to calculate uh, 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 integrals, but we, but we are in a situation which contains these nested integrals, and we cannot immediately apply uh, auto int because there's no um, neural net we found that has this architecture that would actually correspond to these nested, uh, nested integrals. And so instead of solving the actual um, volume rendering equation, we introduce a piecewise approximation in which we're going to say that um, we are going to compute integrals along sections of uh, those rays. So at inference time, rather than approximating the integral along the ray with hundreds of forward passes, now we'll be left not only with two forward passes as we would have desired if we had a simple integral, but now with this nested integral trick, which is also gonna give us some approximation, we're gonna get n times two, so two for each bound and n for the number of sections, uh, integrals to, uh, to compute, to evaluate. And so we have um, some approximation that we discuss in, in length uh, to do that in our paper. So this is the approximation of the VRE. And now if you use this approximation with the following terms, you can actually use auto int for each section. And we tried varying the number of sections. Uh, 
And indeed, as you get to more and more sections, the approximation with autoint is uh, better and resembles more what you would have just simply using uh, NERF. And as you get uh, to fewer sections, well, you obviously lose a lot in uh, the representation in what you can actually represent. And you typically lose high frequencies, but because you only have four sections to evaluate, which correspond to eight forward passes for your autoint uh, network, uh, you are actually much faster. And so at the time, and there's been tremendous work now uh, that we should acknowledge on speeding up um, neural rendering. And there's even a paper now showing that uh, you can even train. And now we are already talking about inference time in this talk, but that you can even train NERF in uh, five seconds. Here at the time, um, while uh, you know it would take 30 seconds to, um, to render um, a NERF, uh, a NERF frame, uh, we would typically take uh, 2.6 sections, uh, 2.6 seconds uh, with eight sections for uh, auto int, which was uh, quite, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a speed up. And we had that uh, demonstrated on a variety of scene. I did, did <coughs> the Hawkins questions uh, from Dave. How does mm -hmm. a sign nonlinearity implemented on a GPU? Is it a lookup table? Oh, I'm not. A, I'm not a GPU. Uh, I'm not a GPU expert. I I do imagine that um, uh, sign are implemented by uh, lookup tables, like like mo most of the most of these uh, most of these uh, transcendental functions. Mm -hmm. A trigonometric function. Sorry, I mean. And so so the model works on synthetic data, as we just showed, but also uh, works on uh, real world scene. And in some views, we can see a few artifacts uh, uh, that come from the piecewise approximation, but the overall image quality uh, is, uh, I would say, is, 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 uh, is OK. OK, so overall, I think this auto and framework is pretty interesting that we can actually learn uh, and, and train these networks to learn closed form solutions to integrals. Of course, there are still many open questions. Um, I, I think some pretty interesting questions too. So one thing that definitely could be looked at uh, deeper is the expressiveness of these grad network architectures. So compared to standard MLPs, which have been, uh, you know, the, the initializations of the, the weights of these networks, the different nonlinearities you can use, and perhaps even what, what uh, the different advantages to different nonlinearities and different architectures, this has been uh, explored fairly thoroughly by this point, but grad networks are an enti entirely different type of architecture that uh, you know, definitely has not been explored as much. The, the architecture has both the original nonlinearity of the integral network and the derivative of the nonlinearity it has this branching tree-like structure. Um, I, so I think there are all sorts of questions of, of how you could make these more expressive and more powerful. And um, are there other pairs of grad and integral network architectures that would go together and, and might be easier to train or more expressive. For our integral networks, we just used a, a pretty simple um, multi-layer percept perceptron architecture, but there could be other possibilities. Um, and another <coughs> open, well, another question is uh, you, could, you could also train the integral network uh, directly. And in fact, you can you can do this. So we only looked at supervising the the grad network, but you can also supervise the integral network as long as you supervise on all the bounds that you would be interested in evaluating this at in your definite integrals. And and you can certainly train things that way, and that also does work. Okay, so we talked about uh, uh, I think we covered a lot of ground this evening, uh, but just to summarize. I think these, these coordinate-based networks are really a, a new and exciting emerging, emerging way to represent signals. Uh, and they've become pretty widely adopted now for many different applications in vision, neural rendering, uh, image and video processing, and even higher level tasks like uh, semantic segmentation or uh, geometry related tasks for uh, modeling shapes or 3D shape completion or shape editing. So, there's really been an explosion of work 
uh, even since, especially since we published Siren on these uh, particular types of neural, on this particular type of neural network. Um, Siren, I think, was really unique in that uh, we showed that using sign nonlinearities uh, gave such a great advantage in terms of overfitting and representing signals. Uh, we talked about how we can use adaptive coordinate networks or ACORN with this hybrid architecture and this adaptive decomposition that we described to scale up uh, coordinate based networks to larger scale signals. And uh, finally, we talked about automatic integration or auto int, which uh, goes into this idea of how we can actually apply mathematical operations to signals represented by neural networks. And it turns out that integration is a really natural um, operation to uh, to perform with with neural representations and neural networks and allows us to integrate neural representations. Um, so in in summary, uh, yeah, coordinate based networks, I think, are a new and exciting way to represent signals and, and perhaps we'll, we'll see these um, more broadly as a, as a general purpose signal representation, maybe uh, similar to how we use uh, vectors or arrays, but maybe maybe specialized particular applications, uh, I think remains to be seen. So I also want to uh, go ahead and, and uh, point you to some other resources. So here are the references to the papers that we mentioned. I think <coughs> I think the, there are also links in the chat at this point as well. If you want to download the papers, they're also available on our website, computationalimaging.org. Uh, you can follow Julian or me on Twitter uh, or check out our, our web pages for additional supplemental materials uh, or videos. And I'd also like to recognize our, our collaborators on these projects below as well. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you again for inviting us to speak. It's been great to be with you this evening. And uh, I think we'd also be, time permitting, happy to answer any other questions that you might have. Uh, Kevin has a <clears throat> question on the chat. Are there boundaries between auto in segments that set at regular boundaries or adaptively established? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, I think we may have had even some backup slides on this, but um, the, the short answer is that they're they're adaptive. So we have a little uh, a little network trained in the loop to basically predict where these segments should go in a ray dependent fashion. So depending on the ray that you query the neural network with, we basically predict where to put these segments, uh, and essentially it, it it learns to position these segments around the object boundaries. Oh, here you go. Right. So for this chair scene, for example, you have a ray going through the arms, you would position segments, basically where the, the opacity would transition, and where you need to model the signal better. Um, Dave is asking, can ACORN be used for partial differential equation solving? Uh -huh. So that's, uh, I, in principle, in principle, you could, but again, because we have unsolved this we have not solved these, uh, you know, transitions between subregions. I think that would be extremely hard with uh, with uh, Acorn because you would be able to solve, say, your uh, PDE within a subregion, but then you would need to propagate, you know, the border condition for the other region. And it's not only propagating in some sense because it's not that you can only solve the subregion independent of the others, right? As you're as you're solving this PDE, all the subregions are interdependent and so you you would you know this would be probably complicated but i could imagine that you that an architecture that would uh, solve this problem i i see no i see no i see no issue in uh, in solving pdes with this type of uh, yeah architectures okay other audience questions So I think it was in the auto int, there was an emissivity uh, section of the equation. Um, this is a, one of my questions. I've worked with different uh, infrared sensors. And so if you wanna get the temperature of something, you have to have an emissivity physical coefficient. You know, is it skin, is it fire that's burning, is it metal? 
Um, so if an IR sensor is trying to read a temperature, you have to have an emissivity. I'm sure you were using it for something different for generating the rendering, um, but uh, could it also be used for uh, sensors in different wavelengths? I th yeah, I think it's a different, uh, different concept. Um, basically, the, the, the uh, emissivity here is not really a physical, it's not really a physical quantity. The, we're kind of using the volume rendering equation not really for uh, uh, you know rendering uh, uh, how light is it's really just a proxy for um, a, the view synthesis problem. So um, basically we're we're uh, yeah th this this um, emission term is basically just a color that we place in the volume together with some opacity. And then the network learns this representation. And this particular formulation of the volume rendering equation with the opacity and the emissivity happens to work really well for if you train, uh, if you optimize that volume based on your camera views and you shift the volume and you cast the rays through and render them with the volume rendering equation, the views just look very smooth and everything looks very realistic. But uh, in practice, you know, it's not anything physical because uh, actually like that chair that was on the previous slide, I mean, that would be made of like uh, some material that is not partially absorbing the light and the light is going to reflect off the surface of that material. So it's just kind of a proxy model that tends to, that turns out to be really useful for neural rendering and novel view synthesis. A question from Edward. Um, on the output of the drum set images, there is a defect of one of the drum skins. It was rendered transparent. Can this be a feature? Where other opaque surfaces can be rendered as transparent. Um, well, so yeah, one advantage of this volume rendering formulation is that it does support transparency. Um, as far as the the particular image of the drum set, I'm not sure, but if you did have transparency in the data in the camera views, um, the the model could actually learn that by just you know, placing a very uh, a low value for the opacity lining up with that transparent region, for example. But it's certainly one of the benefits of this uh, volumetric formulation. Uh, Michael was commenting, can you comment on a comparison with the uh, Fino pixel work, both in terms of technique, in terms of performance. Oh, so I wonder if Michael's referring to uh, planoctries or uh, planoxels uh, or some of the recent work out of Berkeley. Um, planoxels, yeah. So planoxels, I think. Oh, my is... pronunciation problem. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. This is a really recent paper that I think just went up on archive. So. As well, there have been many developments in neural rendering and accelerating these techniques uh, after AutoEnt. I think AutoEnt, uh, you know, we had a bit of a different focus too in terms of learning integrals, but applying it to neural rendering. So certainly Planoxels is, is, is very fast. And even since Planoxels has been out, I think you can, you can train a neural representation in like 15 minutes or something with this method. And now there's a new paper where you can, like Julian mentioned, you can train uh, a, a, a NERF or a, a, um, this uh, neural, uh, neural radiance field in like five seconds. So <laughs> it's kind of exponentially uh, uh, growing the progress that is being made. I also segue to a question that we did not, uh, that we did not answer <laughs> in the chat which is uh, HW, which asks for hardware for training. So obviously you could, obviously you do train those architectures on similar, you know, GPU hardware that you train for, uh, where, where you train conventional neural networks. But I, I really like the question because I do think that if you think those are, you know, the next data representations for certain specific applications, then why not envisioning hardware, you know, the same way you have, um, uh, we built the whole modern computing on, uh, you know, block memories that we can address and arrays we can address. Well, 
Now, now it's a totally different type of addressing if you think about it. I mean, you address via these weird weights that yes, can be still you know stored in in arrays, but you address your representation in a totally different in a totally different way. So, I, I think that's actually really interesting, and and I, I I am wondering if we're going towards that or if it's uh, totally unrealistic because I, as David, David says, seeing how those representation so here it's funny because we were talking about work that we did only two years ago for the oldest but it seems like li literally an eternity there's been so many papers i don't know how many times like nerf has been cited maybe 500 times now um and and saren i don't know maybe 300 something i think it's in 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 very few years this is uh, amazing progress so maybe we're going towards specific hardware uh, from michael from for ACORN, has there been in-depth comparison with compression performance and comparison to traditional image compression techniques? This is a good question. Um, I want to try to pull up. Uh, so we did a, a, we did a bit of an analysis, just looking at the neural network, the size of the network weights, and comparing to something like JPEG compression. And <laughs> overall, for it, like two D signals. It, uh, you still do better with the conventional um, compression algorithm. As you move to higher and higher dimensional signals, it becomes much more expensive to explicitly store these array values. And there, I think you may get a benefit from um, these, these neural representations. Did you do any quantization, like going from 64-bit uh, weights to 16-bit weights or 8-bit weights or something? Yeah. We did not. And there's also yeah, we, a whole exactly. line of work <laughs> on that, too. Yeah. That's very interesting because we've not we've not looked at that. But then, if you yeah, there you really open the door to kind of completely different type of analysis as well. Because we know that you can get very very highly quantized neural networks still with yeah. or quantization of performance. Yeah. For, for classification, but for regression, I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting question because for classification problems, you can. For regression, there's no reason to believe you can't. But I've never read something about it. There's another uh, paper. There's a paper that came out recently from Qualcomm, or it's on archive, where they looked at, took a pretty close look at Siren for video compression. Um, but I think the conclusion is still that the conventional methods are, are, are better. If I linked that in the chat, that might be of interest. Okay, well, maybe I'll wrap up the meeting. Um, so once again, this is a, a joint between ACM SIGGRAPH uh, check their website for upcoming meetings and SF Bay ACM. Uh, we have a quantum computing uh, seminar this weekend. And also in February, we have um, uh, Weight Watchers presentation on analyzing neural net weights. So uh, I'd like to thank the speakers again. Uh, it's been, we have a lot of questions, a lot of interest in everything you had to offer. So that's uh, always great when there's a lot of engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thanks a lot.